Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the market for reserves. And our main question is going to be to look at how the federal funds rate gets determined. And what we're going to discover here is it's determined by good old supply and demand. And we'll see that the Fed does not simply dictate this market, that it influences uh, the uh, supply and demand situation, and that influences, therefore, the federal funds rate. And we'll look at that in our next video. But for right now, we want to look at the basics of this market to see how the federal funds rate is determined on a day-to-day -day basis. And so where we want to go to is to get to this market right here. It looks very interesting. We have a very non-standard looking set of supply and demand curves. We have a demand curve that has a perfectly vertical part, a standard downward sloping part, and a perfectly horizontal part. We have a supply curve that has a perfectly vertical and a perfectly horizontal part. And what we end up with is we'll discover pretty quickly that we'll see that the equilibrium federal funds rate is determined by nothing more than standard supply and demand factors. Okay. Now, in previous videos, we've talked about reserves already. So we do know some stuff already. We know a few things. We know that reserves are part of the monetary base along with currency. Can I, can I experiment? Because I want honestly just to make, just to make sure here. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the market for reserves. And our main question is going to be to look at how the federal funds rate gets determined. And what we're going to discover here is it's determined by good old supply and demand. And we'll see that the Fed does not simply dictate this market, that it influences uh, the uh, supply and demand situation, and that influences, therefore, the federal funds rate. And we'll look at that in our next video. But for right now, we want to look at the basics of this market to see how the federal funds rate is determined on a day-to-day -day basis. And so where we want to go to is to get to this market right here. It looks very interesting. We have a very non-standard looking set of supply and demand curves. We have a demand curve that has a perfectly vertical part, a standard downward sloping part, and a perfectly horizontal part. We have a supply curve that has a perfectly vertical and a perfectly horizontal part. And what we end up with is we'll discover pretty quickly that we'll see that the equilibrium federal funds rate is determined by nothing more than standard supply and demand factors. Okay. Now, in previous videos, we've talked about reserves already. So we do know some stuff already. We know a few things. We know that reserves are part of the monetary base along with currency. The reserves can be either required reserves, that is required by the Fed, or excess, meaning banks or reserves that are held above and beyond what the Fed requires, and the changes in the reserves can affect the overall money supply. So now what we want to do is go into depth in the supply and demand for reserves. The supply of reserves, as we'll discover, is determined pretty much exclusively by the Fed. They have excellent control over the supply. And we'll see that demand for reserves is a function of the Fed, uh, behavior by banks, and behavior by the public. And again, our bottom line here is that we want to see the interaction between supply and demand and how that affects the uh, federal funds rate. So some preliminaries. So first of all, uh, what we've got here is a situation where banks actually trade reserves back and forth between each other. And so the obvious question arises, well, why the heck do they do that? Well, we know also already that the Fed uh, uh, determines the required reserve ratio. You know, that is the fraction of reserves that banks, uh, or the fraction of deposits that banks have to hold uh, as required reserves. And we know that this value, this amount, is just the overall volume of deposits subject to reserve reserves times the reserve requirement. Now, the interesting thing here is that banks don't need to, to meet this requirement every single second of every single business day. They only need to meet the, meet the requirement on average over a two week, what's called reserves maintenance period. And over the course of this period, what, what we observe is that based on behavior of, of borrowers and depositors and banks themselves, is that sometimes banks have excess reserves and sometimes banks are short of what they're required. So again, some banks have more than they need. Some banks are a bit short. Now, the crucial point here is that being caught short is very costly. The Fed reacts rather poorly to a bank that cannot meet its reserve requirements. And so what uh, uh, took place here, what uh, evolved, was that banks uh, and other financial institutions, as we'll see, developed this market for reserves. They trade reserves. So banks that have excess reserves would lend them to banks that are short so they could meet their reserves requirement. And the interest rate on those, uh, those reserves is nothing more than the federal funds rate, as we'll see here in just a minute. 
So we want to look at the demand for reserves. So it's a function of three basic things. Uh, the required reserve ratio as determined by the Fed, the types of deposits that are subject to reserves, and then finally, the federal funds rate. Now, as of right now, the Fed pays interest on reserves that banks hold with it. But let's assume just for the sake of argument, just for the moment, that this isn't the case. Well, if the Fed doesn't pay interest, it turns out that the federal funds rate represents an opportunity cost of holding reserves. And the idea is this, if the if a bank holds reserves on deposit with the Fed and the Fed pays no interest, it gives up possibly loaning those reserves out to another bank and earning whatever the federal funds rate happens to be. So if that's the situation, then the federal funds rate or the, the, uh, the demand for reserves graphed against the federal funds rate is nothing more than your standard downward sloping demand curve. And so what we end up with is that. Now I'm drawing it as a straight line just for convenience, but it's still the crucial thing is it's a standard downward sloping demand curve. Well, here's an interesting thing. Let's think about the situation where the federal funds rate starts out at some at some value like 3% and then it starts to rise. Well, as the federal funds rate rises, that increases the opportunity cost of holding reserves. And not surprisingly, banks will hold fewer reserves because the opportunity cost is rising. So what we're doing then is we're backing along the demand for reserves curve. And so banks will hold fewer and fewer reserves as the federal funds rate gets higher and higher. Well, here's what we might run into. The situation, the situation would be that at some point that system-wide reserves reach a minimum value. Because remember, the crucial thing here is that system-wide banks collectively have to hold a minimum of the volume of deposit subject reserve times the value of the reserve requirement itself. So that minimum amount represents a floor beyond which the demand for reserves will not go. And that's where the, uh, that's where the vertical part of the curve comes in. And so what we see is we see the curve go vertical at the point where we reach minimum system-wide reserves. And so that's how the vertical curve or vertical part of the curve arises. Well, now what we want to talk about is, well, gee, how do we get the part of the demand curve that is perfectly horizontal? In other words, perfectly elastic. Well, we started out assuming that the Fed did not pay interest on reserves. Well, starting in October 2008, they did begin paying interest on reserves. It's 0.25% it's right now. And this is called IOR, interest on reserves for short. And so what we want to, to discover is, well, now that the Fed has done this, how does that affect the demand for reserves curve? So let's suppose, like it is right now, that the uh, uh, interest rate on reserves is a quarter percent. And again, let's suppose, using the example I did before, that the interest rate in the federal funds market starts at 3%, and then it begins to fall. And so if we move back to our previous graph here, now we're moving the other way down the demand for reserves curve. And what we'll discover, of course, is that as the interest rate on reserves falls, that banks hold more and more, excuse me, the, as the federal funds rate falls, banks will hold more and more reserves because the opportunity cost is falling. But at some point, if the interest rate keeps falling far enough, maybe it might hit that 0.25%, in other words, the same interest rate as the interest on reserves. Well, now banks will have a choice. They'll have a choice to loan reserves to another bank and earn the federal funds rate, or they'll be able to hold reserves with the Fed and earn the interest on reserves rate. And so let's suppose that theoretically the federal funds rate fell to, just to make numbers round here, fell to 0.2%. Well, we wouldn't observe that because the federal funds rate would never fall that low because banks simply would, would not lend to another bank at the 0.2%. They'd much rather hold reserves with the Fed at 0.25%. And so once the federal funds rate hits the interest on reserves interest rate, the curve, the demand curve goes horizontal. So we have a perfectly elastic part of the demand curve, a standard downward sloping, demand curve and a perfectly inelastic component of the demand curve. 
Okay, so I just went through this in my example. And so again, the bottom line here, the bottom line is that at the, at the interest rate where the uh, uh, federal funds rate hits the interest on reserves, it becomes perfectly horizontal, perfectly elastic. So our summary of demand here, so under regular normal standard circumstances, we have the regular standard normal downward sloping demand curve. Once system-wide uh, reserves hit the minimum, the interest, uh, the uh, demand curve becomes perfectly uh, inelastic, perfectly vertical. And once the federal funds rate hits the interest on reserves rate, it becomes perfectly horizontal, or in other words, perfectly elastic. Now, we want to turn to the supply of reserves. So we observe we have a fairly weird looking demand for reserves curve. We have a, I would argue, a slightly weirder looking supply of reserves curve. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to assume that the Fed has complete and total control over the supply of reserves. Now, that's not completely true in a literal sense, but it's actually pretty close. So remember the example we did in the money supply creation process where you found $1,000 in cash, you deposited it in the bank, and that became $1,000 of reserves. And so the obvious thing to think about is, well, all right, look, the, the Fed didn't do that. The Fed didn't control that. That was a behavior on the part of a, a depositor that affected reserves. Well, it turns out the Fed is really good at dealing with or offsetting for or accounting for behaviors like that on the part of the public or even on the part of banks. And so because they're really good at doing that, that gives them excellent control over the overall supply of reserves. And what we can do is we can think of two different types of reserves. We can think of what are called non-borrowed reserves, which are supplied by the Fed via open market operations, which we'll talk about in a subsequent video here. And then we'll also have what are called borrowed reserves that are supplied by the discount window. And now we'll also be talking about that in our future video. And the Fed, being a bank for bank, when it loans reserves to other banks, it will charge them an interest rate. And that interest rate is called the discount rate. So again, that's a different interest rate than the federal funds rate. So since the Fed has excellent control over non-borrowed reserves, and at least pretty darn good control over borrowed reserves, overall, it's going to give it excellent control over total reserves. And therefore, since it has excellent control, that gives us the vertical part of the supply curve. Well, that's not really particularly unusual. So in other words, what we've got is we have a supply curve that looks like that. The Fed would be able to manipulate that to the right or to the left as it sees fit. And again, that will be subject for a future video. But the question is we want to look at is, well, how do we get to the, the funny looking part where we also get a perfectly elastic part of the supply curve? Well, let's just suppose for the sake of argument that for whatever reason, that the demand for federal funds, demand for reserves starts rising. Now, again, I'm not going to bother with the perfectly vertical part or the perfectly horizontal part. I don't need that for right now. But as the demand rises, what that would do, of course, that would put upward pressure on the federal funds rate. And as the federal funds rate starts to rise, what might happen is that eventually it might reach whatever the discount rate set by the Federal Reserve is. Now, remember, that's the interest rate that the Fed charges banks to borrow from it. And so once the federal funds rate hits the discount rate, Banks would be indifferent, at least from an interest rate point of view, to borrowing from the Fed or borrowing from other banks. And if the federal funds rate were to go above the discount rate, banks would not borrow from other banks. Rather, they would borrow from the Fed. And since the Fed can lend pretty much any amount of reserves it wants, what happens is when the federal funds rate hits the, hits the discount rate, the supply of reserves goes completely horizontal. In other words, it is perfectly elastic when, again, the discount rate and the federal funds rate are equal to each other. Now, in actual practice, the Fed generally makes a lot of effort to keep the discount rate, again, the rate at which banks borrow from it, substantially above the federal funds rate so that those two interest rates are uh, not equal to each other. So a couple of final points here. First, banks are not the only participants in the federal funds market. Uh, you can think of really the, the, the crucial thing to, to keep in mind here 
is that the federal funds market is a market for overnight loans between large financial institutions. And this is important because non-banks don't have the ability to hold reserves with the Fed and earn interest on reserves. And this is why, in point of fact, that the actual federal funds rate, at least right now, is somewhat below the 0.25 interest rate on reserves. Because if only banks participated in the federal funds market, we'd see the federal funds rate at exactly 0.25% right now. Banks or non-banks uh, don't have this option, so they have to trade with each other in the federal funds market. And so that's why the actual federal funds rate turns out to be somewhat below the interest on reserve rate. So wrapping up here, our demand for reserves curve has a standard normal downward sloping segment, a perfectly vertical inelastic segment, and a perfectly horizontal, perfectly elastic segment as well. The supply of reserves curve has a perfectly inelastic segment and a perfectly elastic segment. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is this, standard supply and demand factors still are going to determine the going federal funds rate. And so what we'll see up in our next video is how the Fed influences this market to influence the federal funds rate.